Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Professor Brown. Uh, welcome back. I'm here to talk to you again about John Dewey's Art as Experience. And today we're talking about chapter two, entitled The Live Creature and Ethereal Things. Dewey starts the chapter with a discussion of the compartmentalization and the separations that tend to be a part of the way we think about things. Um, including the way we tend to separate art from everyday life and experience, um, as well as uh, from our um, creatureliness, our animal nature. As we said before, Dewey disdains dichotomies and separations, always looking for the underlying unity, and this chapter is no different. Um, however, he does admit the reality of these separations, the um, fact of this compartmentalization of experience, but he identifies them not as sort of ultimate dichotomies, but as a feature of our culture, as the way we organize our lives in modern civilization, a product of our institutions, our practices, our um, economic and political and social relationships. Um, now, Dewey focuses in on the word um, on the word sense as a way of um, as a way of thinking about a potential bridge uh, for these separations and to get at a kind of underlying unity. Um, so he asks us to think about all the forms and cognates of sense, including. Um, uh, the sensory and uh, sense organs, the sensational, the sensitive, the sensible, the sentimental, the sensuous, and making sense, like making sense of an idea. Um, these notions all related to sense run the gamut from uh, physical sensations, the sensuous, our sense organs, to the emotional, uh, the sensitive, the sensational, the sentimental, uh, to the dimension of meaning and thinking, um, even the rational, the sensible. Um, sensible is a word for, for reasonable, right? Um, so uh, already he, he points out that our, our everyday language um, has these kind of deep roots that belie the compartmentalization. And then he reminds us about his notion of experience with this restatement. He says, experience is the result, the sign, and the reward of that interaction of organism and environment, which, when it is carried to the full, is a transformation of interaction into participation and communication. So here, here again, Dewey is reminding us of that organism-environment interaction that pr produces and constitutes experience um, and uh, which, again, belies that sort of separation, um, uh, the, the separateness of the experience from the world. Um, and then he returns to a theme that's important uh, from the end of the last chapter when he tells us that art is prefigured in the very processes of living. Um, he's drawing this continuity between um, art and aesthetic experience, experience in our everyday life, and the very notion of life, the very processes of living, um, even for um, non-human animals. So he points to examples like the bird's nest um, as, a, as an example of, of art, or the beaver dam as an example of, of art, or at least the way art is prefigured in life experience. Now, of course, um, we can ask, right, is it really art? Is a beaver dam really art? And Dewey admits that it, it, perhaps it lacks the directive intent, is his phrase, of what we call art. Um, uh, so so we, might, you know, we might not say the beaver dam is art or the bird's nest is art, um, but he says that these are the conditions of life that such an intent, a directive intent, that is necessary for art grows out of, and ha it has to work with these kinds of, these conditions, these, these uh, processes. So maybe the beaver dam's not art per se, 
but it is an activity on the same order of art. Um, and when, when it becomes conscious and deliberate for humans, it becomes art properly so called. Um, so, so Dewey uh, has this quote, uh, this key quote on page 31, where he tells us uh, that art is the living and concrete proof that man is capable of restoring consciously, and thus on the plane of meaning, the union of sense, need, impulse, and action characteristic of the live creature. Um, the intervention of consciousness adds regulation, power of selection, and redisposition. Thus it varies the arts in ways without end. So, so notice you've got two different things going on here. On the one hand, you've got continuity. Art is proof that, that, um, that humans can get back to the union of sense, need, impulse, and action that's characteristic of the live creature. But they do so consciously on the plane of meaning um, and, and thus with regulation and selection and redisposition. And finally, Dewey tells us it's uh, the intervention of consciousness also leads in time to the idea of art as a conscious idea, the greatest intellectual achievement in the history of humanity. Because if you've got the idea of art, then you can not only um, uh, you know, use consciousness to regulate and select art, but you can actually think about the nature and meaning of the whole process of art itself. So continuing on the theme of that compartmentalization that plagues our modern condition, Dewey talks about um, the distinction we're wont to draw between the fine art and the useful arts, right? So um, another way in which we might uh, want to um, sort of separate art out from everyday life as something special is to distinguish it from the activities of making uh, that we call the useful arts. And Dewey here again rejects the dualism. Um, whether some, you know, he, he, he puts the burden on the person who, who wants to say there really is a dichotomy here. Um, and he argues instead that whether something uh, is put to use, right, in some way, has nothing to do with whether it's aesthetically fine or not. Um, and we talked about uh, some examples of this in our discussion last week. Um, now, Dewey, Dewey says, you know, under different social conditions, being aesthetically fine might itself be considered um, a source of, of the usefulness of something, right? That a broader sense of what is useful might be in order. He does point out that under our social conditions, often everyday articles of use are not aesthetic. Um, they're either you know, bare and utilitarian or even ugly. Um, and he sees this uh, not as a matter of the sort of difference of fine art and useful art on some kind of scale, but rather as a feature of um, the conditions of mass production and of the cheap kind of disposable culture, um, the culture of the disposable. Um, so um, he really wants to push us to think of, of art, artifice, um, artifact, artisan, um, as having a kind of underlying unity, right? The, all, all of the arts, practical and fine. Um, now, something I want to point out in terms of examples of art uh, and artists that Dewey talks about in the chapter, there's a, there's a kind of funny... Um, there's a funny thing going on here. He refers almost exclusively to writers and poets rather than artists in a more concrete medium like sculptors or painters. Um, I wonder, you know, why that is, what you think about that. Um, uh, you know, he's making references to things like the, the bird's nest, the beaver dam, um, technology, um, also to tribal art, African and Native American art are referenced uh, or exhibited in the course of the chapter, um, but no recent visual artists. So it seems like there's a missed opportunity for uh, comparison there. I wonder what, why that is and what you think about that. Um, now near the end of the chapter, 
uh, and maybe this is one of the reasons that Keats comes up, um, is uh, Dewey, Dewey talks about Keats' notion of negative capability, right? Um, so, and, and Keats regarded Shakespeare as the sort of exemplar of this virtue of negative capability, which consists, in Keats' words, of um, being capable of um, being in uncertainties, in mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Right. Um, so I'm going to say that again because I think it, the wording is important. Negative capability is, is the virtue of being capable of being in uncertainty, being in mysteries, being in doubts without reaching after fact and reason. Um, you know, I wonder uh, how you think this fits into Dewey's discussion in this chapter, why it's supposed to be a virtue. Um, uh, I'd be interested to hear what you think about that. Um, now, this, this chapter also treats us to a discussion of perhaps Keats' most famous lines. Beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all ye know on earth, and all ye need know. And this is, um, this is from Keats' Ode on a Grecian Urn. Um, uh, and much discussed philosophically and uh, artistically. Um, Dewey's contribution to the discussion is to remind us that when Keats talks about truth, he's not so much as talking about logical truth or the truth of a proposition or of a scientific fact or theory. Rather, he's talking about truth in the sense of um, maybe you would say living your truth, uh, although that's not quite capturing exactly what P, uh, what Keats means either. Um, what Keats means by truth has to do with moral conviction, moral behavior, um, with how to live your life well and rightly. Right? Um, and uh, Dewey here uh, sees a close connection between um, the role of art in uh, in life and the and the role of um, uh, this this notion of sort of of the moral truth uh, uh, of it. So um, I think I think it's an important notion for Dewey um, why uh, why art is such an important thing for the philosopher to think about is because um, there it, it does kind of get us away from this overly intellectualistic. Um, uh, set of notions and takes us back in the direction of, of experience and, and, and life. Okay, so um, those are some of the things I found particularly interesting in the chapter uh, that I wanted to think about and talk to you about. Um, I'd be interested to hear uh, what, you were interest, what you were interested in, what you were thinking about. Obviously, it's a pretty rich chapter. There's a lot going on, uh, several things I didn't bring up. Um, but uh, uh, I look forward to uh, the further discussion. Uh, so I'll see you soon.